Hi, I'm Mac McCarthy, and I help people with their breakups. And today we don't have a live caller, but we still have a gem of a show. And I really like this book. I recommend it to a lot of men that are coming out of breakups, a lot of single men out there. It's probably one of the top five books that I would recommend about dating, marriage, just relationships in general with women. It's called The Tactical Guide to Women by Sean Smith. Um, I believe he's a psychologist by trade, but I'm going to get into this. I have notes, so I'm going to be reading it. I actually, um, when my new website hits, I'm actually going to have a book notes section that has PDFs and summaries of books that I've read. And I personally love book summaries and book notes. We used to call them cliff notes as a kid. Uh, but now, now there's so many people that do them. Let's just call them book summaries, book reviews. There's a load of YouTube channels on them. I appreciate how they break them down. I still recommend you read the whole book or listen to it on Audible. But this one in particular, um, with everything that's out there for relationship books, such as Models, Mark Manson, um, The 3% Man, Corey Wayne, which I will review soon. I've done it before, but I'll do it again. Uh, people really at, uh, really get a kick out of that. And um, these, these notes were compiled... Uh, through other people's notes. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through this book. Um, excuse me, the notes to this book, the tactical guide to women by Sean Smith. First, first of all, what do you think? Put it in the comments below. If you watch this, uh, if you watch this after it's been live, what do you think the tactical guide would mean to you? Like, what, what do you think that means? What do you think the point of having a tactical guide to women is? It's kind of a catchy title. And, I, and I'll talk about this another time, but the 3% man, Corey Wayne, I have a lot of respect, I have a lot of respect for him. I understand where, he, where he's going with that title. Uh, but, it, I mean, could we get a different title than the 3% man? I don't know where that came from. It's, it's like, why can't it be the 4% man? <laughs> okay, so the, ca the tactical guide to women... Uh, is a mix, and I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to comment in between so you won't see my eyes the whole time. Uh, the Tactical Guide to Women is a mix of a relationship advice book and a dating book for men. Nice combo. Sean Smith, the author, teaches men how to find the perfect woman to start the best and healthiest relationship you can have. So right there, I will stop and I will say, I'm not sure there is perfection in women. <laughs> Clutch, do you believe that's true? Um, by the way, Clutch, it wasn't planned. I just went, you know what? I've got these uh, book summary notes that I do want to share. And so uh, being the spontaneous coach that I am, I just, I just did it. So have you heard of this book, The Tactical Guide to Women by Sean Smith? So the Tactical Guide to Women delivers a solid plan for allowing the right women into your life and keeping the wrong ones at a safe distance. Now, let me, let me talk about this for a moment because this is something that I've been coming across again and again. Um, I don't think people realize the lack of pickiness or filters or... How should I say this? blinders that you have going into long-term relationships sometimes where people will go, well, I knew this about her, but then four or five years later, it becomes a real problem. And then, you know, while they're, they're breaking down what happened in the breakup, the mother-in-law was always a problem, never liked them. And now during the breakup, when shit's hit the fan, they real now, now they're really in the girlfriend or the wife's ear. And you're wondering like, oh shit, I always knew she was against me. There's, there's things like this that add up later on that are hindsight 2020, connect the dots, whatever you want to call it. And so what I like about what he talks about is that when you get to a certain maturity level, he doesn't use that word, but when you get to a certain level and you've gone through a few relationships, you've gone through a few breakups, and there might be some times where you blame them or you blame yourself or you have some guilt um, or you have some shoulda, coulda, would that are really popular. Um, I know that I had a lot of those when I was 
in my bad breakup years ago and I look back and I go, that breakup had to happen and was inevitable and it's laughable to me to see where I've, where I've grown from that. But what we don't realize is a lot of time with men, and he, re- he says this in the book, uh, is you filter for attractiveness, hotness, if you will, uh, beauty first and foremost, and then you let everything else fall by the side. You deal with it as you go along. And if you're in your 20s and the intimacy is good, that might be a whole nother, nother ball game. So continuing on, you'll discover how to identify good women of low drama and high character. How does that sound, Clutch? Identifying good women of low drama and high character. Sounds good to me. Reduce your vulnerability to women who seem perfect for you but aren't. Great comment. Uh, Just had this recently in a live stream um, where the gentleman was saying, be aware if someone uh, idolizes you or puts you in a light that is... You're the greatest guy I ever met. You're so wonderful. And it's only been three weeks. I love you. I want to get married in two or three months. Beware of where that's headed. Going zero to 100 means you can go to 100 zero really, really quick. Spot the early warning signs of emotional instability. Now, this is interesting because sometimes when I hear these blanket statements like, emotional instability. If someone brings this up while while I'm in a coaching session, I'll say, well, what does that mean to you? Because some of these big words, these big phrases, um, they might have a definition on the internet, but I want to hear what your definition of it is. Um, And what I would say for emotional instability is that they're up and down, Flighty is a word that comes to mind. I don't even know if that's an English word, but that's a word I use. Um, They can get triggered by things that you don't agree or something that you need to be that dramatic about. Um, And you know what I would add to this that he doesn't write in here, but this has become a big issue, is the amount of people, especially in the Western world, especially in America, that are dating someone that has, dare I say, a mental illness where it's uh, se- se- severe depression, anxiety, uh, bipolar. Okay, the list goes on. Um, and you start dating that person and they reveal that to you. Now, this might sound cold and discompassionate or uncompassionate. If you have no experience with that, you have no friends, family, or colleague members that have ever had it. And you think, oh, that's okay. I'm on board. And they tell you, look, you know, I've suffered this for a long time off and on. Beware, because you might be stepping into something that you have no knowledge of. And if you're the right fit to uh, deal with that, you might make it worse for those individuals. What I mean by that, you might, you might uh, not be contributing to them getting better but contribute to them getting worse. Uh, one of the things that's also overlooked emotional st- instability, I should add to the, to the box, and people overlook this, men and women, is uh, substance abuse. So substance abuse, had, you know, we, we all know about alcoholism, drugs, prescription drugs are big also. Let's not forget those. Those count just as much as any other drug, folks. It's... It's basically the unwritten, untold story right now in the States. I mean, we got presidents running for office, and they don't even talk about the issue with um, pharmaceuticals that are legal that are a problem. I'm not going to get into that, but I think people know what I'm talking about. Now, what, where am I going with that? I would apply that to emotional instability. If you start dating someone and you go, yeah, they, they kind of pop, pop this one painkiller a little bit more than I like. Beware, because that's not going away. That, and if they drink a little bit too much, but you know what? On Friday or Saturday night, why not get wasted? And then we have really good intimacy. I've had a client like that. Well, I didn't really mind the drinking before because, we, you know, when we hooked up, she was great. And then I'm like, and then you live with them 
or you start spending more time with them and their erratic, impulsive behavior, you're like, where's this come from? People that generally have substance abuse issues or alcohol issues are more impulsive. They're more up and down. Why is that? Because the, you know, the chemistry in your body's off and on, right? If you have a hangover in the morning, are you at the same level of sound, reasonable, logical thinking that you would be um, if you were sober? Hell no. Uh, Clutch says, I dated someone of low drama and high character. What they don't talk about, security is boring. Blame my upbringing for the mindset, but it takes a lot of discipline. Well, you got to find the sweet spot, right? I would say that that's true in some cases and not true in other cases. Uh, but thanks for sharing. Uh, Leandra says, hey, Mac, is a tactical guy to women trying to understand and navigate us? If it is, I'm reading it. Substance abusers will have the same characteristics of a psychopath. Wow, really? You think so? I don't know if I would. I, I mean, psychopath to me, I think someone could be a substance abuser and not be a psychopath. I don't think that those are uh, two things that automatically go together. Um, maybe, maybe I'm being biased in the sense that, you know, friends and family members that have been substance abusers, I don't find them to be psychopaths. Uh, but I suppose that would, that would lie in what you define as being a psychopath or the characteristics of a psychopath. Because to me, psychopath is, is extreme. For number one, if you're a psychopath, uh, one of the things that stands out are psychopath eyes. You've met these people that are talking to you and they're like this? Yeah. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, psychopaths show no emotion, no pain. Yes, absolutely. There are functioning alcoholics, for example, but take that substance from them. Well, one thing about alcoholics and substance abusers, the drug, the alcohol always comes first. Uh, you'll, you'll also learn critical techniques for seeing women clearly, the most common mistakes that lead men into disastrous relationships. That's a big plus. How to reduce the odds of a good relationship going bad. I think one of the biggest things is people think they were in a good relationship. And correct me if I'm wrong on this in the comments. People believe they were in a good relationship. And this is why you should talk to a coach, therapist, a uh, highly respected friend that's in a good relationship that you respect and you you're unpacking it and you're like this isn't a good relationship well i love her well you know that it what it wasn't a good relationship you didn't line up well about the author sean smith is a clinical psychologist coach and author he also writes on his blog docsmith.co d o c s m i t h the, the, book, the book is divided into three parts. The first part serves to help men understand themselves. Isn't that a enlightening thing to do? I think human beings overall uh, disregard the fact that um, a lot of us are being conditioned by our environment, our values c coming up, and we don't learn ourselves until we get out of those environments that we've been conditioned by or we have some time to catch our breath. And I'll tell you what. Out of a breakup, you're single again, you're alone, you're going through it. That's actually a time to find yourself a bit. Find out what you really want. Stop going through the motions. Stop doing what maybe your parents told you you're supposed to, you're supposed to do or college swayed you to go in this direction. Number two, the second part is about understanding good women and avoiding bad ones. Great concept. The third part is focused on common mistakes and risk Mitigation, including legal ones such as prenups. Marriage is a momentous. I didn't really plan this well, did I? Marriage is a momentous decision. You must do it carefully. Well, that's no groundbreaking statement, is it? Getting married is one, possibly the most important decision of your life. You must be careful and strategic about it. Hmm. I think strategic is underrated. I often tell people when they're facing a divorce to, when, when divorce is inevitable, assets are being sold, a lawyer has been got by the other party, at some point you're going to have to get strategic. What I mean by that is um, when there's assets involved, 
when there's dogs involved, yes, I said dogs because people care about their dogs when they're in a divorce. Um, when there's kids involved, all, 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 the, all the rest of it, and someone says they fell out of love with you, at some point you're going to have to accept that, put your heart on the shelf for a moment, and go, okay, where am I going to end up after this? Right? I'm not telling anyone to go for the throat, but you got to look after yourself because you're soon to be an individual, not a married individual. Research shows that men in stable marriages earn 20 to 24% more money, enjoy more and better sex, are happier, healthier, and live longer. See, this is where one of those things... <laughs> Whenever someone goes, research shows... And these are notes that, um, you know, are from the book. It's like, who's the sample size? Where was it taken? It's possibly true. But sometimes we think, oh, research applies to the world. It doesn't. Sometimes it's inaccurate. And, I, you know, I, I could easily say that I bet in certain demographics of the world or certain places someone would say, uh, and, w and what's the definition of a stable marriage? Right. So th there's all kinds of variables here. This is my issue when people throw around research that they weren't a part of. So they got it from a, um, you know, from the Internet or something else and they throw it in there and they go, yeah, research shows this. OK, what was the what was the um, research based on is what I'd ask. Um, and and is there a possibility if someone's talking about their marriage in a controlled group of questions. Could they be lying? <laughs> Maybe that's a negative outlook, right? On the other hand, broken marriage is extremely costly. Wow, this is sage advice, isn't it? Marriage can present the best return on investment of every decision you make, or it could be the costliest mistake of your life, quote unquote. If you get married without being strategic about whom you marry, you are gambling. And since it's more likely that you end up with a partner who is not a good fit for you than one who is a good fit, you are gambling with the odds stacked against you. I don't know why he would consider that it's uh, more likely that you end up with someone not a good fit. But if you learn to read the signs of a good partner, then you can put the odds in your favor. Now, what I would say to this is, in my own experience of talking to is it in the thousands? I don't know. A lot of people about their relationships and their breakups. A lot of people. And I'm not just going to say my coaching sessions, friends, family, and colleagues. Many people don't read this book before they get in relationships. And even if it was given to them, they'd say, you know what? I don't want to read that. Sally's hot. We have a good connection. And I love her. Right? Right? They're, they don't look at this. They're, they're not going to be strategic. It's going to be emotional. It's going to be physical. That's just the way it is. It's human. But then someone gets in a breakup and they go, holy shit, I just had my heart ripped out of my uh, chest like Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. And I'm thinking to myself, what now? I want to make this work. I want this. And then they go, they go looking around. And they go, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I overlooked some things about Sally. Maybe I actually wasn't thinking in a, in a way that was strategic, reasonable, and logical. Maybe I gave her too much of the benefit of the doubt. Hindsight's twenty twenty. So when you read these books, you're just like, people aren't ready for them until they have a bad breakup. Right? I mean, unless you have a paramount... And some people get lucky, and I don't use luck often, but they grow up in an environment with good parents that show them good values. They grow up in an environment that has more like-minded people like them, and they meet one. It's possible. What women want. Leandro, I'd like your take on this. In decades as a psychologist, I've heard plenty of complaints about husbands and boyfriends, but I have never heard a woman wishing their man was more like a girl. Sean Smith adds, masculinity to the list of traits women want, and that's a central theme of his book. Wow. Groundbreaking, right? Do you ever get to the point, Rob, you've read a lot of books. Clutch, you've read a lot of books. I'm at the point where I can say I've listened to a lot of Audible books, read some books, 
And a lot of this information is just repackaged, okay? So you can't get to a point with um, attraction, relationship stuff. There's only so many things you can learn. What I would say is two or three books on the topic, and then when you start going like seven, eight, nine, ten, a lot of it's the same stuff, right? Would you agree, Rob? Because you, you're a voracious reader. Do you ever feel like, wow, this was supposed to be... I Like um, the great Jordan Peterson, who I have a mountain of respect for, love his lectures, love his YouTube content, Uh, the the 12 steps or I, 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 forgive me what's the book called Rob um, when I took a look at that book I felt like some of the information there was redundant for me doesn't mean it wasn't a bad it was a bad book it was just at the time that I read that book I'm like wow I expected something the messages were messages I've read in other books just repackaged right so um books hit you at the right time and then if you keep looking you keep looking you keep looking you get to a point where you go all right i've read about this before they just recycled a story that i've read before but the reality is the other person recycled the story finding original stuff um is hard like i said love jordan peterson love his work brilliant man i rarely use the word brilliant brilliant individual but when I read the book, you know, in the one of the first thing, you know, one of the biggest things is to clean your room and to make your bed. Um, groundbreaking didn't come to my head. Brilliant didn't come to my head. I thought to myself, I've read about this before. Yeah, I suppose um, the message is enhanced by the individual in some cases, right? It holds more weight because someone of, of prestige and power says it or, or brilliance. <clears throat> okay, so Smith says that masculinity has been under attack by a small vocal minority in recent years in the West, but it's misplaced attack. Positive masculinity is not toxic and women like it. Interestingly enough, this is probably a quote that Mr. Peterson, Dr. Peterson would have agreed with. Uh, risk mitigation, number one, know yourself. I think, Clutch, this would be right down your alley, risk mitigation. The first step in your romantic risk management strategy is knowing yourself. I kind of, I don't like using the word kind of, I don't like risk management, risk management strategy going into a relationship. <laughs> As Smith says, you can reduce your uncertainty and risk by understanding what makes you tick, I agree, and why you choose certain women, I agree. Without that knowledge, you are the most uncertain variable in your romantic life. Now, this is a great quote. I think a lot of times you don't know what makes you tick when you're looking at who may be a potential partner, right? You can have a very good date with attraction, flirting, maybe even you hook up. But after hanging out with that person, you can tell like, yeah, they don't line up with what makes me tick. They don't line up. They're not going to help me grow in the direction I want to grow in. Or, yeah, I don't like this about them, but it's okay. Smith says, to know yourself, you should know, number one, you came from your past. Some people tend to find partners who soothe their deepest insecurities. Isn't that the truth? Number two, where you're going. You must be clear about your personal values. No man can know what kind of woman will best fit into his life until he knows what his life is about. The most important value for a man is his purpose. I almost get sick of reading this narrative of finding your purpose. Lack of clarity and purpose attract lower quality women and the wrong ones. So you're not going to find someone that helps your future until you know your future is what I would say, or you don't know your target. This idea of knowing your purpose never suggests how to find your purpose or what are some examples of purpose. Um, I think it's very important uh, and where a book goes further than notes and summaries is anecdotal or examples 
via stories or personal stories are even better. And so I would say in relationship to my own life, in my early 20s, I can honestly say my purpose was probably to finish college, which took me a good five to six years. Now, I also never came across any self-improvement books, or I don't even think I've ever had the conversation in my early 20s of a man needing to be on his purpose. I wouldn't even know what that means. That's 20 years ago. I'm wondering when someone hears that, and it's thrown around a lot, and I understand it now. First of all, is there only one purpose? Second of all, can't we agree that the original purpose was to have kids? Because to me, once someone has kids, and I'm not, I'm not telling everyone out there that's listening to this right now to ha- go and have a couple kids. I'm just saying, wouldn't you agree? I, I believe Rob, Clutch, Leandra, if you're still on, I don't think you guys have kids either, guys and gals. Wouldn't you agree, though, that if you did cross that threshold, that that becomes your purpose to take care of that kid, to raise that kid to be a good human being, to clothe them, to feed them, to give them some good morals and values? I, I, I believe that, that was, that's how humans evolved. And now we have a situation in the world where people don't necessarily, people don't necessarily have that. And that's okay, myself included. That's okay for different reasons, right? You know, some people ignorantly will ask someone, oh, my God, you don't have kids. Or, you know, they don't know if there's been three miscarriages with with the guy's girlfriend. They don't know. You know what I mean? It's like sometimes you just don't know. So what I would ask you, Rob, thanks for commenting here, is... um, Chemically, your body pushes that as being the primary narrative unless you have a screwed up child. <laughs> You're not talking about yourself, Clutch, right? Oh, man. Dealing with people now, it's so funny how many people go, well, I just had, I wish I had a normal relationship. What the hell's a normal relationship? Something you saw on TV? <laughs> um, Man. And then you'll talk to people that think that they have some really big issues with their parents. And they're like, wow, that seems pretty petty. Um, So it's just different for everyone, right? Ha ha, there's a reason I don't want kids, right? Well, it's a choice, right? It's a choice. Um, Anyhow, just getting back to this, books seem to push this to have your purpose. And I think there could be uh, a whole workshop, seminar, or book chapter on how you go about finding that, knowing that, or zeroing in on that. One thing, going back to uh, Jordan Peterson, he calls it having a target or an aim. So he rewords it in some ways. And I've talked about this before. This is why people go to university, right? Because um, it's very clear. All right, do this, go to this class. We have a schedule. We have grades for you so we can judge you and tell you about how good you're doing. And then at the end... Your target is to get that diploma, which will lead to this. A good job, hopefully. What gets you out of bed? Number three, men are happy and fulfilled when they get good, doing what they're driven to do. Once you know what drives you, present yourself exactly the way you are without deceiving women. The way you will attract and maintain women who are a good fit for you. Interesting, right? Being true to yourself. Being okay with um, stating something that not everyone's going to agree with, right? Now, knowing Rob, the gr- the great Corey Wayne, as and Rob is a big Corey Wayne fan, I believe, and I've talked about this already. Sorry for being redundant, but I thought it was really interesting because Corey Wayne, uh, during the presidential race, really um, backed. Uh, Donald Trump publicly and I thought to myself wow you're getting into politics you know because he's a relationship coach right 
Um, he's got a huge following. Um, he's earned that by being on YouTube a long time. But for him to cross over into that, I thought, wow, man, that's a booby trap, right? And seeing him interviewed recently, he went, no, I lost a bunch of business from it, but that's my belief. That's what I believed was right. And he goes, that's real masculine energy uh, or masculinity in the sense that if you don't like what I believe in and I have a platform that I can share my beliefs, um, then that's up to you. And I thought to myself, I thought to myself, the way he explained that, and maybe I'm not explaining it well, whether you like, whether you agreed with him or not, he's saying that I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, sit on my vocals about something that I feel passionate about, right, that I feel is important, whether I agree with it or anyone else agrees with it. He's saying, I built this platform, right? So I can use it for whatever I want. And so, um, well, whatever it is, Rob, I'm with you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going there as far as, um, if he just, it was justified in, in some of the beliefs that's debatable. That's opinion based in a lot of ways, but on the flip side, him having the balls to go, you know what, this is going to affect my business. This is going to affect, you know, my reputation. Maybe there's, I'm going to lose some, um, clients. I'm going to lose some viewers. Right. Right. And then he goes, well, so be it because I, I want to be on my purpose. I want to be about who I am. I want to be consistent with my values and who I am. I don't want to hide anything about that. I respect that. I don't agree with what Corey Wayne says, but I will defend his right to state it. Absolutely. The above three also form chapters of knowing yourself. The first chapter where you come from is most useful for people who have some deeper insecurities or troubles. The second chapter explores values and how you can find out your values. <laughs> if you're, <laughs> I'm laughing because, um, <laughs> I remember, I don't know what, I don't know which self-improvement book it was. But it might have been Tony Robbins' Awaking the Sleeping Giant. And I didn't read the book. I listened to a book summary on the channel 1% Better. I don't know if anyone's heard of that channel. 1% Better. And um, I believe something from that book sparked me to go do some journaling. And I, this was years ago. This might be five, six years ago. And I don't, I don't remember ever writing this out. But if you want to know your values, are you ready? Ask yourself the question, what are my values? What do I value most? And journal it out. Don't have a friend, family, or colleague member in front of you. Don't be worried about what you're going to say or what they're going to think. Just write it out. And I remember being surprised by what I wrote. I remember being surprised by what I wrote uh, at the time. I remember being surprised by what, and by the way, your subconscious is going to uh, sequentially, did I say that correctly? They're going to put it in order of what's most important. So whatever comes first is most important. That's the way I've used it. The subconscious will work that way in my viewpoint. If you ever studied NLP or any of these things. Um, and I remember what came up for me. I was like, wow. That's the number one thing. But it lined up. I was like, it's true. It's true. And if you go, if you do that exercise, which again, if I put this in a book, it wouldn't be groundbreaking, would it? It wouldn't be like, oh my God, this guy came up with this brilliant idea. A lot of the best information, a lot of the best work done in self-improvement with yourself is journaling out good questions. And then you get to a certain level and you get a coach or a therapist and they ask you questions and then you talk them out. The problem is, is when you're at a level in your life where sometimes you need to journal it out because you're so insecure and you're so conditioned to your environment that you actually have an answer that you don't want to share. And I've had that in coaching sessions where I'll ask a question and I can tell they're acting like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. No, whenever, whenever a question comes up, sometimes the brain will say, I don't know if you don't know. But if it's an opinion-based thing about yourself, like, 
what do you value? Something came up. You don't want to share it. Or you think, oh, that's not really it because that's not the right answer. It doesn't sound intelligent enough or it doesn't sound cool enough. Try that out, though. If you want to know your values, that's why I'm laughing. Whole chapter dedicated to that. Write the question, what do I value most? What are my values in life? And it'll come up. It'll come up and it'll surprise you. It says, the mind needs supervision. The mind is in the business of short-term relief and pleasure, not long-term success. Do you agree? This is how men assess long-term mates. You ready? What do you guys think? How do you think men assess long-term mates? The better question is, how do you assess long-term mates? Number one, dun-dun. What do you think? Number one. Number one way men assess long-term mates. This is groundbreaking stuff, right? This is a book. Attractiveness. <laughs> Sorry, but when you... This is what's amazing. It, this is a really good book. Uh, but when you look at the notes and everything strained out of it, you're like, oh, yeah, that seems pretty simple. <laughs> Um, attractiveness, attractiveness is based maybe on fertility or the ability to be a mother. Uh, this is why men are attracted to certain, uh, features, right? Number two, very distant second is how good a fit is, sh is she for us? Now, I'm not even sure what that means. Does that mean that, um, chemistry or connection? So I don't. A very distant second is how good a fit she is for us. He writes He writes on, women are equally poor and maybe even poor at assessing long-term potential, so don't count on them to help you out there. Smith proposes a simple solution for long-term successful relationships. Number one, are you ready for it? Are you ready? Screen for a good personality fit first. Groundbreaking stuff here, folks. I'm being facetious and sarcastic. This is a good book. But when you strain the facts away. Um, to get a little deeper, what would be a good personality? Right? I think a lot of people would say sense of humor. Um, understanding. Caring. Right? kind, or maybe I'm just mentioning the things I, I like in a personality, right? I don't know. P good personality fit first, right? Personality would re be related to values. Number two, ready for it? This is for the long-term successful relationship. Finding an attractive woman among the ones who are a good fit for you. <laughs> so if she's attractive, but you know she's not a good fit, but she's fun and exciting, you still got to get rid of her because she's not a good fit for you, is what he's saying. If we're talking about long-term relationship, I think it makes sense if you're more in a short-term mode than attractiveness first. Attractiveness first. I don't like that word, attractiveness first. And no consideration for good fit can make sense. I'll buy it even for a one-night romance. A good fit always makes it more pleasurable. No pun intended with the word good fit, by the way. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, that term good fit can mean so many things. It's, it's, it's not a good way to write this. Watch out for the tendency of rescuing women. This is a big one. This is a big one. I've never fell in this hole before. I've known people that have. I don't think it's always the guy's fault or even the woman's fault because women rescue men too in some ways. I believe that some people are manipulated or they just haven't come across a situation where they love someone, they fall for them, and then they, they become someone that has so much pity for them 
that they, they feel like they have to help them all the time. Some men have a strong tendency of chasing broken women, seeking to fix them and make them feel better. This could be uh, because of childhood. Um, the reasons men white knight to rescue women are they believe healthy women are out of their league. God, just the term... It just makes me cringe whenever I get a client that goes, I think she was just out of my league or she's just out of that guy's league. And I go, if you say it about someone else, that means that you're jealous. I will say this. Playing devil's advocate to my own point of view. Someone, when they first pulled an individual woman that is a, quote, high-quality woman in society standards, she's got a lot going for her, and you look, and let's say you meet a couple, and you meet the guy, and you meet the woman, and you go, wow, this guy's dating out of his league. I mean, she's got it all, and he's, uh, you know, an average Joe, whatever you want to call it. First and foremost, there might be something hidden about that guy that you don't know. He might have a huge inheritance. He might have a huge heart. He might have a huge, I don't know. But there's something that might be more than meets the eye, as the great G.I. Joe said. But here's the other thing. If the person's really out of their league, woman or man, eventually they'll break up usually. Eventually they'll break up. So... Nature will run its course, and at some point, that'll take care of itself. Those relationships don't usually stay, stay long. And by the way, someone can meet five years earlier, be at a different place in their life physically, mentally, financially, and the other person was out of their league. So sometimes you see the person, you know, someone gets an injury, someone loses a job, like injuries. You know, you don't have to be a ball player to get an injury. You can, you, can, you can be taking the garbage out and have a severe injury and, and break your ankle or do something really bad that puts you out of commission and debilitates you from exercising for a long period of time. I mean, there's all kinds of variables. So um, getting back to this, why, just getting back to the topic, the reasons men white knight to rescue women are they seek this, and I don't know why it's a white knight. Can you tell me why it's white? Uh, they seek the thrill of being powerful figure in her life. I could see that. They're avoiding their own problems by fixating on someone else's. Yes, I can see that. Their upbringing made them comfortable around people who are in constant crisis. Ding, 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 ding. This is correct. Says the author, I've, ne I've never seen a truly altruistic white knight the need to rescue women is a pretty reliable sign of insecurity with a man white knighthood is a recipe for resentment you'll tire of her drama and she'll tire of your supervision so it goes one way or the other the author says that i'll bite white knights are rarely truly all altruistic they tend to be good people and are rarely mal Malvolent, malvolent, malevolent. <laughs> but you must restrain from it, he says. If you seek real, famil real fulfillment, then only pursue fully functioning adult women who know how to internalize responsibility for their lives. Wow, that's a deep statement. You imagine going on a first date and going, so do you internalize responsibility for your life? I just, just a quick question before we get started here, hon. Smith's point of view here is that broken women are okay as long as they are willing to work on themselves. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm laughing about this because these are the notes. And this is the summary. And this, is every, this is the facts and the meat of the book strained out. And then when you read them like this, you're like, so, yeah, you know what? I've noticed that you've had some problems, but are you willing to work on it? And are you willing to go to a therapist? Are you willing to go to drug rehab? Okay, cool. I'll stick with you then. 
Otherwise, your stance should be get help or lose the relationship. Uh, my, <laughs> you know what? Getting help is just one step. You being alongside them while they're getting help is a whole other obstacle. That's a choice. And what I've noticed is while they're getting help, some people get worse. Uh, a lot of times, especially in substance abuse situations, mm, sometimes they need to go about that on a solo mission. Not always, but depends on the situation. It's your moral duty and obligation to help your partner, but if she isn't helping any, then she can't be helped and will only drag you down. It's your moral duty and obligation to help your partner. I believe if you've been together a while or if you're married, sure. This is where it gets a little murky. I know clients. I know clients that think it's their moral duty and obligation to take care of a broken individual or troubled individual might be a better way to put it. That they're dating long distance from an online meetup. They've never met the individual. This is where I'm like, what the? F well, have you guys met each other? No, 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 no. No, mate, we've been seeing each other for about six months now, mate. Seeing each other, what do you mean? Well, we're, we're supposed to meet up in, you know, July. Okay. There's drama involved with someone you've never met before. You're having trouble meeting up with them after six months. And they got emotional instability issues. They got family problems. They don't like their best friend. Work sucks. What? I've come across this and I'm just like, we got to work on how you're filtering situations, right? Because dating dynamics has changed so much in just the last four or five years. It's like right now we have, um, and Rob, you know more about this than I do because you're a financial guru, genius, what have you. You, you. I mean, anyone that's bought Mass amounts of bill, uh, Bitcoin. You're a genius. I'll give it to you. You got the crown, right? Um, there's all these videos out on what to do right now, and it's it's kind of crazy, right? Because the stock market might crash, the dollar's falling, dot dot dot. I'm not a financial genius wizard. Whatever, ha what have you? I'm not. God damn, I've been given good advice that I believed in. And I just didn't act on it, right? But right now, there's all this information going in different directions. And, and you know what's the crazy part? You go to Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett's this billionaire genius. He's made all this money. Very simple tactics from what I could read. But he doesn't like Bitcoin because that's not how he made his money. That's not how he came up. Right. Relationship tactics. Now, if you go to someone that's a therapist or a coach, I've been around for 30 years helping couples get through their marriages for, you know, actually, you know, probably 35 years. OK. And I know it's like, I'm sorry. For about 20, 25 years, things were probably similar. The last five years, last three years, shit changed real quick. The dating scheme has, has gotten flipped upside down. People are having long-distance monogamous relationships with people they're watching movies with in different bedrooms, in different rooms, in different fucking countries, and that's common. Wrap that one up. Oh, yeah, we had date night. Really? In different countries, in different time zones? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right, folks, I'm going to continue this tactical guide to women by Sean Smith on a second post because there's more notes to this. I know you're going to be waiting on bated breath. Uh, Clutch, get in contact with me if you'd like to do that Saturday. I'll do my best to make it work. I'd really like to be on your show again. I think uh, it's a lot of fun, 
And if we can make that time work, I'll do it for you, bud. Social media changed people's ability to be crazy. In the past, people were sh were shunned for being nuts. Nowadays, meeting new groups is as simple as a swipe. Man, let's talk about that maybe on your show. Maybe that'd be a good topic. If that's common, then then the reality is very flawed to such an extent where it might affect one's actual reality when it comes to semi-normalized semi dating. All right, folks, we'll get into this again. The Tactical Guide to Women by Sean Smith. Good book. I know those notes seem very simple. We'll unpack it on a part two soon. I do. I will go over Coach Corey Wayne's 3% Man. I have a whole summary on that of about seven pages of notes. Um, I'll start doing this uh, in between the call-ins. Uh, if you want to book a live coaching session, go to writemac.com, W-R-I-T-E-M-A-C.com. If you want to check out my Instagram, it's Coach Mac McCarthy. The Discord, I believe, link is in the notes. Otherwise, it's curtains. Have a good day.